welcome in the spirit of the living Christ, and I can welcome the people on Zoom too, because we've got everything reconnected now. And I would like to share with you uh, a few announcements. <clears throat> the first is next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. And so we will be sharing communion. It will be within the pews as we've done it before with the, the prepackaged cups. And so uh, we invite you to be a part of that. And those of you who are at home, all you need is bread and juice uh, of whatever kind you so desire. And you can be a part of communion as we share it together. Uh, so next Sunday marks the beginning of Advent. I would also uh, take a moment of very uh, special privilege. Um, who I was talking to on my watch is our son, Kevin, who every week uh, takes care of the Zoom recording and the sound that goes out over, over the internet for our recorded service. Uh, Yesterday, he celebrated something, and so I've asked the choir to lead us in, in singing a belated happy birthday to Kevin. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. And as we continue our worship together, we have the opportunity to be reminded each week, one, that we are forgiven people. Forgiven, that's who we are, forgiven people. And because we're forgiven, we can let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. And so I say to you, may the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. I would invite any and all who are able to stand to, to greet one another from a distance with signs of affection and, and welcome. It can be making eye contact. It can be an air hug. It can be a wave. Uh, it can be the I love you. Whatever way you, you do, uh, let us greet one another so that uh, your presence is, is well known and, and we're glad you're here. Oh, well, thank you for the parts. That's all. Hello, everybody. And and now I invite you to let the prelude. Open your heart and spirit to the presence of Christ in our midst.
Thank you, Karen. I would invite you to join with me in our affirming our identity in Christ through the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is error, truth. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is joy. O Divine Master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying to ourselves that we are born to eternal life. Amen. I would invite all who are able to stand as we sing together number 225. be seated. Our scripture lesson for the last time, at least in this series of sermons, comes from Colossians 3, the 12th through the 17th verse. Today we are focusing on the, the last part of verse 16 and verse 17. Therefore, as God's holy and loved, God's choice Put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Be tolerant with each other, and if someone has a complaint against anyone, forgive each other. As the Lord forgave you, so also forgive each other. Over all these things put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. The peace of Christ must control your hearts, a peace into which you were called one body, and be thankful, people. The word of Christ must live in you richly. Teach and warn each other with all wisdom by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Whatever you do, w whether in speech or action, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus and give thanks to the Father through him. May God open our hearts and minds to hear his word this day. Well, Steve, Steve Bragginton uh, sent me a series of, of one-liners from a, a comic that's old enough for all of us 
to remember, but I'm not going to put you on the spot in case you don't. Uh, but this is what he had to say. It's the start of a brand new day. And I'm off like a herd of turtles. When I say the other day, I could re be referring to any time between yesterday and 15 years ago. And the last one I, I wrestled with, but I included it anyway. To me, drink responsibly means don't spill it. Well, we can chuckle at these. All of them have to do in some form or fashion with getting older. And, and in our culture, as you get older, you lose things. It's amazing we don't focus on the things we gain as we grow older, like wisdom. Uh, we focus on the things that we don't have, the things that we lack. And that's important to recognize as we look at gratitude and it becoming contagious in our lives, if it is to do so, it means, first of all, we have to look at life differently. Our world bombards us over and over and over with what we're missing, what we're lacking, and somehow, if we get it, we're going to be happy and fulfilled and safe and secure and go on and on, whatever you want to add, except it's never true. I can remember longing for a new car and, and, and getting it under some fairly um, devious means. I told Cinda that our son Jeff and I were going to go out and look at cars before dinner, and I came back for dinner saying I had just bought one. Uh, Cinda was not too happy, and I remember very distinctly that car that I just thought would be the car to have, it lost its luster very quickly. And that can be said over and over and over again. Our world teaches us to look at the things we don't have. But gratitude changes our focus to look at the things we do have. Gratitude is focused on seeing life in terms of gifts received rather than things missing or absent. During my time in my first church, I was in an informal clinical pastoral education group. That, that's a group that meets with a chaplain and we would uh, go over case studies. And one of the things we would do about every nine or 10 weeks, we would have what's called an interpersonal group where we'd be sharing different things that were going on in our lives. And, and this IPG, as we call them, happened to come the, the Thursday before Thanksgiving week. And one of my colleagues in that group was talking about how someone had come into his office for counsel and he said it was the most depressing thing he had ever experienced because all this person did was recount all the things that were missing from her life. All the things that she didn't have and wished she had. All the things that were absent or no longer present. And he said, I, I wasn't sure what to do, but... I was working on my sermon for this Sunday before Thanksgiving, and it was on, on gratitude, so I decided to ask her this question. When I was certain she had finished going over her litany of all the things that were wrong with her life, that were missing from her life, he said, are there any things you're thankful for? It didn't take her long to spew out the list of all the things that she was missing, but there was one of those uncomfortable silences that if you've ever been in a counseling situation, uh, 30 seconds can seem like 30 minutes. And there was a silence, and then she began with difficulty to share, well, yes, I'm thankful for this. And yeah, I'm thankful for that. 
And she continued. And he said, the most amazing thing happened. Before the session was over, the mood in the room was entirely different. And she stood up and she said, thank you. That's the most helpful advice I've ever gotten. And he really didn't give her much advice. He just asked her a question. What are you thankful for? We have to consciously think about things we're thankful for. Oh, there are times when it just comes and bursts upon us, and those are great. But there are plenty of times that if we will simply sit down and think about the things that we're grateful for, our lives will change. And gratitude becomes more of a part of us than not. I had a, a good friend when we lived in Venice who was a retired federal judge. He had no hands. He was missing one leg. And yet he was one of the most extraordinary people I've ever been around because he focused not on what he was missing, but on what he had. And one of the amazing things was he became a skilled craftsman. And in addition to being a federal judge, he became a skilled craftsman with his handless arms. And he built pieces of furniture that if you didn't know better, you would have never guessed that he was the one that built them. Because he spent his time focusing on what he could do and what he had instead of what is missing. If we're to grow in gratitude and it is to become that contagious power in our lives, we need to look at life differently, first of all. And the second thing we need to do is begin to look at all the obvious blessings that are a part of our lives day in and day out that we simply take for granted. The things we ignore because we're so used to them and take them for granted. Think about it. You don't think twice about turning on the faucet to get nice clean water unless you happen to live in Flint, Michigan several years ago, and there's no such thing as good, clean water. We don't think much uh, about having a roof over our head, but there are neighbors in our community who sleep out under the stars and the clouds and the rain. There's so many blessings that are a part of our lives every single moment of every single day that we just simply take for granted. Sometimes we're too busy. Sometimes we're just not paying attention. Sometimes we've gotten so doggone used to them that they're just a part of life and we don't realize how incredibly special they are. One of my mentors and, and friends, Norman Neves, shares a story of, of sitting with his wife watching some TV on a Sunday afternoon when all the pressure of the week was gone. And they were watching TV and his, his wife drifted off to sleep. And he looked down at her hands. And he was overcome. He started thinking about all the things that those hands represented. He thought about the many meals that those hands had prepared with love and care. He, he thought about the diapers that had been changed. He thought about how many times those hands had gotten behind the steering wheel of a car to, to take something to school that had been forgotten. 
how those hands had held hymnals and allowed her to sing so beautifully in church and otherwise. And he thought about all the acts of love that were wrapped up in those two hands. And he became acutely aware of of how many obvious things that he so easily didn't see because he was so busy serving a church. But he began to recognize in his wife's hands the obvious gifts and blessings of God that came through them. And no doubt if the, if the roles had been reversed and Kip was, was looking at his hands, she would have seen many, many special things as well. The point is that there are many obvious blessings in life that we get too wrapped up in our schedules, in our plans, in our to-do lists, in our activities that we simply fail to notice because we're too busy, whatever that may be. When gratitude starts to take hold in our hearts and lives, we start recognizing the obvious blessings. And they are legion. If you have the opportunity, spend some time today and just jot down the obvious blessings that you're typically too busy to notice or too preoccupied to notice or too focused on something else to notice. Not only does gratitude really require us to look at life differently, if we're going to have that kind of gratitude that's contagious, it also challenges us to look at the obvious elements of life. And as we do those two things, gratitude has this incredible power. And that is to develop in us an ever deeper trust in God. The more we are thankful, or to use Paul's words, sing to God with gratitude in our hearts. And in everything we say, think, or do, give thanks. The more that happens, the deeper our trust in God becomes. It's it's not in our hymnal that I'm aware of, but there's a wonderful hymn in the United Methodist hymnal called Stand By Me. Not, Not the popular tune that you may have heard, although the popular tune probably came from this but it was written by Charles Albert Tidley, a great black preacher and songwriter of the early 1900s. As he was growing up in the South, his family was literally dirt poor. But his father was a person of deep trust in God and and gratitude and abiding faith. And so one evening when the cupboard was very literally bare and there was nothing to put on the table that his amazing mother couldn't whip up into a meal. And the family gathered around the table. His father insisted that they hold hands and bow their heads and together he prayed a prayer of thanksgiving, thanking God for all the blessings that had been bestowed upon them, thanking God for watching out over them, thanking God for walking with them in every moment, including the difficult times. 
And when the prayer was over, young Charles was asking himself, why in the world did my father pray that? We don't have a single thing to eat. We're going to be hungry tonight. And he hadn't even finished his thought when there was a knock on the door. And some neighbors came with plenty of food for that night and the next day and offered it as a gift. And in that moment, Charles Albert Tidley's life was changed. And he began to understand that deep trust in God that his father had. And it, it came through in his preaching later on and certainly in his writings of hymns. And if you have the chance, look up the hymn by, by Tidley. It's T-I-D-L-E-Y, entitled Stand By Me. And you'll get a sense of how that, that gratitude impacted his life, how that deep trust in God influenced him. It is fitting that we conclude looking at becoming like Jesus with gratitude. Because without gratitude in our hearts, I would say it's next to impossible to become like Jesus. But when gratitude is reigning in our hearts, I would also say there is probably nothing that can stop us from becoming like Jesus. Paul's words are so true today. Sing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Whatever you do, whether in speech or action, do it all in the name of Jesus and give thanks to God through him. So be it. And amen. This morning we are going to do something we haven't done for almost two years. And I, for one, am very excited we're going to do it. We're going to have an offering. And one of the ways we express gratitude is through our gifts. And so I hope you will find this time to express your gratitude through the presentation of God's tithes and offerings at the conclusion of, of this, we're going to do something else we haven't done in almost two years. And that is, those who are able, I'm going to ask to stand and sing the doxology.
Almighty God, we give you thanks for these gifts. And we give you thanks for the gifts that you shower upon us in every moment. And we ask to be thankful in every moment, even when it appears there is no gift or blessing, because always your love for us is steadfast. And may that be our continued source of thanksgiving, gratitude, and praise. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray this. Amen. Please be seated. Will you join me in the spirit of prayer? Almighty God, we come before you this week of thanksgiving, and we ask that you will sharpen each one of our senses to see your presence and your blessing in not just the spectacular events of life, but the everyday events as well. That you will lift our eyes from lack to abundance. That you will help us see the, the overwhelming abundance of your blessings and all the things that you pour into our lives that money can never buy. Slow us down when we're too busy. Free our thinking when we're preoccupied. And open our hearts to ever grow deeper in our trust of you. And as we pray on, on this week, we give you thanks for all those who will be serving us and giving up perhaps Thanksgiving time with their loved ones in order to protect us, in order to be available to us in our hospitals, in order to ensure our well-being and safety. We remember especially those families with service people in them that are apart many miles as loved ones serve this country. We remember the sacrifices that those families make in these moments. And we give you thanks for all. Be with our leaders at every level of government. Make them all true servant leaders. Free them from the idol of power. Free them from the sinful lust to control. Free them from the lure of dollars and donations. And make them your humble servants who seek to serve as they lead and lead as they serve. Help us to heal the wounds within our country, the divisions, the tribalism, the, the walls, the barriers, and make us extensions of your loving care who build bridges, who spend time listening, who reach out and care. We lift up these and all our prayers in the name and spirit of Jesus the Christ. And as his people, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I would invite all who are able to stand to sing our closing hymn, Now Thank We All Our God, it's number 788. Please be seated. Would you join me in our benediction and remain seated for the response and the postlude as well so elders can go to the back of the church. We go nowhere by accident. Wherever we go, God is sending us. Wherever we are, God has put us there. God has a purpose in our being there. Christ who dwells within us has something he wants to do through us where we are. And now as we go forth into this week, I invite you to trust this and to go in the joy of God's power, the joy of God's grace, and the joy of God's love. So be it.